Hey everyone, this is Mike Wolf and welcome to the Spoon Podcast. Yes, it's the Spoon Podcast, not the Food Tech Show. Uh, we've undergone a name change, but really that's what people call it. When I have people reach out to me and they ask if they could be on the podcast, they call it the Spoon Podcast. And that's what our publication is called. So I figured, why not? Why not make it actually the Spoon Podcast? Uh, so we've undergone a name change. We change up the logo and really it's the same old podcast, the same great guests, the same great conversations. And so keep on tuning in. You don't have to change anything on your podcast app. It's all being changed automatically for you via the RSS gods, just flipping that switch. And it is now the Spoon Podcast. So that's that. We also took a little bit of a break and we have a bunch of great content loaded up for you. We're going to actually be publishing the podcast on a two to three times a week basis. Coming out with great shows. We've got a bunch of them already lined up for you. We have the CEO of Gelatech. We have the CEO of Motif. We have Samantha Rose, a longtime kitchen and food tech inventor, entrepreneur who uh, is who just sold her company to Pattern. So we'll be talking to her. And just tons of great stuff lined up. So I encourage you to keep coming back, subscribing to the podcast. And as always, we encourage you to give us a review. Uh, we appreciate that. We're also kicking off essentially a new season. So you may notice this is season five, episode one of the Spoon Podcast, formerly the Food Tech Show. And I'm super excited about this first episode because Scott Heimendinger uh, is a friend of mine. You may know him as Seattle Food Geek. And he's a longtime food tech entrepreneur who has been in the space ever since his early days, uh, really kind of innovating around consumer sous vide. He wrote an article for Make Magazine. He had his blog, Seattle Food Geek, and really kind of figured out a way to make a low cost, 50 bucks or so consumer sous vide circulator. And then that led to his company, Sancerre, where he started it. That it was one of the first startups in that space. You know, we also saw Nova, you saw Namiku and a few others. And eventually he went to work for Modernist Cuisine, working with Nathan Mirvold, not once, but twice. And that was where I really got to know him during his second stint working for uh, Modernist Cuisine. And then he started to get the itch, the bug to recreate and create a new form of kitchen tech. And that's really what he's doing now. Uh, he filed for patents. He's keeping it super secretive. Uh, in, the, in the meantime, he did take a quick uh, stint to help a Nova launch their steam oven, their combi oven. Uh, but right now he's working full time for himself and really kind of keeping it secretive on what the next product's going to be. So we, we talk about that. I try to tease it out of him, but I don't have much success, but I do get a lot of great lessons from Scott on what it takes to innovate and what it takes to find the great next great category creator in the kitchen. Cause that's really what he's trying to do is create a new category. And that's what gets me excited to hear. So I'm really excited to hear what eventually this is. So I hope you enjoy this conversation with Scott Heimendinger. I know I did. But before we get to the podcast, as always, just want to encourage you to subscribe to the podcast in any of your favorite podcast apps. Also, we are having the Smart Kitchen Summit this year, and that is on November 9th and 10th. And if you are a food tech startup, a kitchen tech startup, I encourage you to go to the smartkitchensummit.com and apply for the startup showcase. There's about 10 days left to do that. I encourage you to do that. If you have the next great idea, um, why don't you pitch it? Why don't you, why don't you go and fill out that application? Let us know. And uh, hopefully we can have you on the main virtual stage for the Smart Kitchen Summit. Finally, just kind of quietly, I'm going to let you know that the Spoon is uh, powering CES's food tech program this year. This is something that we're going to write a blog post about. I'm just going to kind of let you know via the podcast, but that's something that we are super excited about, something we haven't talked much about yet because uh, it takes a while to get these agreements with these big companies, but we're excited to be working with CES. I've been talking to CES about doing food tech for literally the last five years. And finally this year, they're doing it. And we're super excited and proud to be the company behind the program. We're, we'll be doing a half day conference and also we will be helping them with their exhibition. So, you know, if, if you want to know more about that, just reach out to us at the spoon. You can go to the spoon.tech and you can find out ways to connect with us there. Just uh, connect with us via the tips line or whatever. Uh, you, you reach out to me on Twitter. Um, we could connect about that, but I'm super excited about going to CS, the first in-person conference I'll be going to in about two years. It's been about two years since February, 2020, when we had our event in New York, excited to go back to Vegas, fully vaccinated mask on and to talk about food tech with people. So, all right, that's it for now. Let's get to our conversation with Scott Hyman here. Scott, 
Scott, I, have I ever had you on the podcast? No, first time as a guest, long time listener. Long time listener, and you've been at our events, so people probably are familiar with you if you if you come to the Smart Kitchen Summit or whatever. But I want to like talk with you about a lot of things. I could spend like two hours talking to you, like like your yurt you're building in the woods. I, I could talk to you about that. <laughs> it's super fun. <laughs> I think you're the only person I know building a yurt, so that's kind of cool. Um, but I'm not surprised you're doing that. But like people probably know you from your time at Modernist Cuisine. You did a stint at, at Anova. And but before all that, you were like this tinkerer had a web blog, a blog called uh, Seattle Food Geek. I think you took people on your little journey writing about like you're developing this thing, which eventually became Sancerre sous vide circulator. Yeah, uh, this I mean, it feels like ages ago, right? When the <laughs> it, earth because was it cooling. was ages ago, maybe. <laughs> it That's was why. ages ago. Um, uh, but it was like a real transformative thing for me. I, I was working at Microsoft by day, and then I kind of fell in love with uh, food and cooking. But, uh, you know, I'm not that great just sort of as a, um ad hoc artist, right? Like, a, you know, you see some chefs do some, like, plating moves, and it all looks super slick. Just like how people can freehand draw. Like, I can't do any of that. But then... I started hearing that there was this other way of cooking that was like cooking for engineers. Uh, Math and cooking? What? <laughs> right. Um, and uh, and Nathan and the Modernist Cuisine team were kind of leading the way documenting that. But this was long before the books were out. And I just totally fell in love with the fact that I could produce the results that seemed to only be in the rarefied air of chefs. But I could do it through means that made sense to me and my weird engineering brain. Yeah. And you wrote a piece, I think, that eventually showed up in Maker magazine. And that was around, I think it may have been a lot, a lot of the stuff you're working on in your blog went into a Maker magazine article around the 2010 or time frame. I think that particular article was referenced by uh, Lisa Fetterman when she applied for her patent. And then uh, I think maybe it was referenced in other patents as well. But like you were the first one, I think, that was really kind of documenting that kind of home sous vide circulator. I think there were other circulators, right? But you were the one focusing on kind of a small one, right? Yeah. Uh, w by the time that I stumbled across the existence of sous vide as a concept, it was really like e-gullet uh, was the place it was being discussed and people were yeah. still kind of figuring out what are the rules and what are the times and temperatures. And um, Nathan Mirvold was was already running experiments. Douglas Baldwin was already doing calculations and, and several other people were trying to really take it out of sort of the shadows or this protected space <laughs> o only that only chefs could play in, uh, yeah. especially uh, in particular. And, and, and democratize it, to use an and, overused term, but yeah. Yeah. Uh, and so... So from reading that stuff, I kind of figured out how it worked in principle. And then I went, OK, well, how much does it cost to buy a sous vide machine? And it turned out they were like twelve hundred dollars on eBay. And you had to hope that it wasn't used to, like, keep Ebola warm in a lab somewhere. And were uh, and these all like water baths? These were uh, these were the poly science laboratory immersion circulators. Okay. So. Uh, at the time I was looking around, uh, that was it. Like nobody had made a sous vide machine uh, marketed that way. Shortly thereafter, sous vide supreme came out and they were the first uh, consumer sous vide machine. But even those, they were expensive. They were bulky. They were unstirred baths, whatever. And I just decided that it shouldn't cost $1,200 to heat water uh, and kind of reverse engineered how it worked. I thought maybe... 10 people in the world would find that was interesting. And so I put it up as a blog article uh, for a DIY $75 sous vide machine. And that turned out to be the beginning of a very long journey and a yeah. twisty career path that I couldn't be more It totally about. changed your career. You, it, you ultimately, yeah. um, you started a company. I think uh, you, you may have raised funding, but Sancerre did pretty well on crowdfunding sites. I think you crowdfunded your first one. That's right. Yeah. At the time, we set the new high water mark for uh, food and drink uh, funding. On oh, you were the, you held that crown for a while. The, we the held it. Drink. We held it briefly, uh, and then Anova came and took it with their next. Anova campaign. Came, I think um, Pico Brew took it from them at some point because, mm -hmm. like, they raised a bunch for their beer machine, and I don't know who holds it now. I should probably check in on that since I write about the stuff. But <laughs> and so, and then at some point. You, you know, Sancerre, um, it, it was, it became a commoditized market. I felt like the, the consumer CV market became kind of commoditized. Anova got acquired by, by Electrolux. Good for them. And mm -hmm. then you went to work with, uh, Nathan Mirvold, kind of the guy he'll kind of usher in the, the modernist cuisine movement. Yes. Uh, 
he, uh, I was very lucky. Um, I was working at Microsoft at the time, and I had the blog and everything, and uh, I, I managed to get the attention of Nathan's PR person at the time, and they let me come in and visit in the lab, and uh, I got to meet Nathan, and I think he sniffed out that maybe I was the right kind of crazy to be useful, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and uh, then I went and did a little stage uh, there with the culinary team, and, and eventually Nathan found a home for me at MC. And in total, I was there for uh, seven-ish years. Wow, I didn't know it was that long. Yeah, in two stints. Uh, in two stints, at, yeah, yeah, and yeah. And doing a, doing a pretty wide variety of stuff. Yeah, yeah. And the second stint is when I really um, got to kind of connect with you more and, and, and watch what you've been doing. And I've been excited to, to watch you over the past five years. You've also did a stint at Anova. They were building this which a lot of the, the readers of The Spoon and the listeners of the podcast know, the Precision Oven. And so mm-hmm. I think they actually announced it at my event. is in 2016, Steve Savagian got on stage and said, hey, we're going to do an oven. And um, it took them a while, but they did get it out. And it's a pretty cool oven. They did, yeah. I was, uh, I was really thrilled to get the call from Steve. Uh, said, what do you think about steam ovens? And I said, they're inevitable. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to help. Uh, and, uh, and he and the rest of the Innova team very graciously let me play in their sandbox uh, for a while. Uh, and we released the Innova Precision Oven, which, um, from my perspective, is the first home combi oven that really delivers on the professional set of features. Not just an oven yeah. with steam, uh, but that, that really is sort of like a mini rational um, and uh, it was super fun and really challenging. Um, but I, I'm so happy to have had the opportunity to participate there. They're inevitable, like climate change, death and taxes. <laughs> yes. We were, we were going to have steam ovens and you predicted it. And, and yeah, there's been like, you know, Tabal has done a great job with a low cost one. You know, that steam does make their meals taste pretty good. But yeah, what sets yours apart what makes it like a rationale or what what's set the nova oven apart made it like a rationale what were the the things that made it professional like well so it's a little bit of a a paradigm shift and it involves some terminology that may not be familiar to to everybody so remember back in the early days of sous vide where you kind of had that moment of perspective shift where you realized that the doneness of your food was about like time and temperature uh whereas like you could read a recipe and say, cook the steak for four minutes per side, right? But we all know now, oh, that's such a naive way of thinking about doneness. It's, no, it's really about the internal temperature. Well, the same type of perspective shift happens when you start thinking about real combi ovens, is that it's not about the temperature you set on your oven dial. It's about the temperature your food experiences in the oven. And those are two separate things. And that's a big surprise to a lot of people because we don't think about it this way. And the temperature that your food experiences is called the wet bulb temperature. Mm -hmm which is the temperature of the air around it minus the effects of evaporative cooling. And that becomes a rat hole, and we could spend a whole two hours on that. But really, the breakthrough and the reason that this oven is different from the others that came before it is that we could sense and control the wet bulb temperature of your food, which means that in addition to doing all sorts of great oven stuff like baking brownies and whatever, you get to cook sous vide without the bag, without the water bath which is a really big deal for people who cook sous vide because those two things are the biggest pains in the ass. Yeah, and like just makes great bread. It just makes food taste better. And yeah, the sous vide thing is really cool because I still am pulling on my sous vide circulator using my Innova. And because like you, there's just certain food that just tastes so much better with sous vide. I haven't splurged for the oven yet, but I, at some point I will get a steam oven. Probably because you know my wife, you, you've met Tiffany. Uh-huh. She, she's just tired of all the new appliances I keep bringing into the house. So. Yeah. Oh, no, I had a charm offensive uh, with my wife, especially because I was starting with like pre-release builds and I yeah. I had to uh, politely ask for the counter space in the kitchen for something that wasn't done yet. Okay, Steve Savasian said came to you and said, what do you think about steam ovens? Okay, what year was this? When was this? This was, oh man, asking me to keep track of time in the era of COVID. Was it like when you're still a, building a, it and kind of developing it? So this was... Um, they they had announced, hey, we're going to do a steam oven, and then the acquisition started, and things kind of got put on hold. So this was round two of really kicking it off, which was, uh, I think I think we first talked in very early uh, twenty, either late twenty nineteen, uh, early twenty twenty. I think it was late twenty nineteen, and this was really at the 
kickoff of the project, you know, saying, hey, let's do it for real. So before uh, any, many, you know, manufacturer designs, anything was finalized. The scope was we want to build a steam oven and they had gotten some blessing around that. But really, what's it going to be and how is it going to work? Mm -hmm. and, 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 you know, the thousands of details, that stuff was all to be designed. Yeah. You know, you, the fact you said it's inevitable, I've been hearing that like from like, I think Phil Tessier, who worked at Heston, like when we asked him, like what he wanted next for the consumer kitchen steam oven, I think Wilson Rothman from the Wall Street Journal, who you probably know as a oh, kitchener, yeah. it's like, let's get a good steam oven. So I feel like it's all the people who are super into like technology meets cooking have been saying, why don't we have a good consumer steam oven? Yeah. It, you know, back in the days of Sanzer, we would sit around and, and we kind of realized, like, look, as you said, uh, sous vide machines kind of became commoditized. And it was only a matter of time until you could walk into a Rite Aid and buy a sous vide machine on the same aisle that sells the like Oster toasters and the you yeah. know, $25 blender. It was just the question was just how long was that going to take? And I think it's the same question for uh, combi ovens, uh, steam ovens or, or combi ovens. I use the terms interchangeably is that, you know, when you go tour some new downtown apartment and you see the appliances that are built in, there's going to be a combi oven there. It's just a matter of how long that takes. Yeah, I think you're right. And so if we look at like the kitchens of the future, kind of putting aside all the things like robotics and AI and like all that crazy stuff that is going to be cool, 3D food printing. Um, I think steam ovens going into like the built-ins, like the combi oven becoming a built-in and maybe that 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 built in being somewhat modular, and I do think like we're seeing early signs of this in California. I think the other big change in the U.S. at least will be the move towards induction heating. So yeah. like you see cities and and counties like Berkeley saying if you do a new build, you cannot put gas in. Yeah, you have to do electric cooking. And so like we like to see the flame. It's macho. It uh -huh. is cool. Like induction cooking is just so much better for in the home. Yeah. And I think consumers will at some point will realize that. There are so many cooking technologies where like, you know, if the, the oceans rose and civilization was destroyed and we were starting over from scratch, we would just we would skip dry heat ovens. We wouldn't invent them again. We would just go yeah. straight to combi ovens. We would skip, you know, uh, natural gas stoves. We would just go straight to induction. Why haven't we reinvented the microwave oven yet? Like the technology is there. I just it's driving me crazy. So. I don't I don't know, but uh, my uh, my Starlink Internet is about to show up for our uh, off grid <laughs> yurt. And I may have to hold the chicken skewer in front of it and see how long it takes. Yeah. to cook. It's going to take Elon Musk to say, hey, I'm going to reinvent the cooking machine and maybe everyone will get excited about it. But oh, God, please don't. Elon, yeah, stay, yeah, so, stay, stay on track. It's the yeah. one thing we have left. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Give us so, a wide berth here. So while we're talking about like what's exciting and, and new, you are building something which is still, I think that you're keeping behind the velvet curtain, but like you are, uh, can you hint or kind of tell us in general area what you're building? Like, and you're doing a yeah. cooking thing. You're doing something in the kitchen. Yes. So I, uh, uh, I left Inova uh, to really go all in on a project uh, that I've had in mind. It's actually the, the same reason that I left Bonner's Cuisine, is I have an idea. Uh, it's a little crazy. It's something that nobody's ever tried before, uh, especially for the consumer space. It's hardware. It's for home cooks. Uh, and uh, it involves... Um, it involves electronics. It, it involves working with your hands, uh, but uh, but it doesn't exist as a product category right now. And That's so, amazing. I'm, yeah, I'm having to invent a lot of things from scratch or or cobble together um, uh, bits and pieces from lots of other disciplines and try to get smart on all this stuff. And I have I have never felt dumber, uh, but it's also super fun. My mind is like, I just can't help but wonder what it is. Like if it, you're saying it doesn't exist as a category, like the kitchen space has just been one where there have been companies after companies like building stuff for, for centuries at this point. Yeah. So I'm just amazed. I can't wait to see what it is. This is this is why I was willing to take the plunge and uh, and well and and you know bite the bullet of how expensive it can be to do uh, some of these activities. Okay, so you, you're not going to tell us what it is today, but you you will break the news on 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 the spoons podcast. Of and course, day, I'm make, I'm holding you to that. Of, I mean, uh, you never it, committed to that, but I'm holding you to that. I, but, unless unless I can do it at the Met Gala, uh, but okay. you, you, <laughs> yeah, we'll do pay per view, some sort of pay per view. That's right, but. But, okay, I do want to hear the story of, like, the 
bolting up in the middle of the night, like, and and you realize this hasn't been done. Like, is there a story there? When did you realize there's a thing that hasn't been built yet? Well, it, I actually I arrived at uh, at this. I arrived at the decision to do what I'm doing by slightly different means, actually. So um, I have, uh, this is, I mean, it's going to sound like bragging, but it, but I've just never been short on ideas. Uh, I'm not worried about like running out of ideas or, or finite ideas. They're not all good. Uh, many of them, are, <laughs> many of them are stupid or terrible, but, uh, but I think it's, it's actually pretty important to not filter yourself too mm-hmm. early to let some of the absurd ideas through. Cause often there's kind of a nugget of something valuable yeah. hiding in there. Um, and so I had a bunch of ideas floating in my head of things that I might, uh, want to try to, to make a business out of, try to make a go out of. But then there were also some things I knew just about the way I wanted to work and the way I wanted to kind of set up my life, uh, that factored in. So for example, uh, if I decided, Hey, I want to make a new type of refrigerator, right? That is not something I can do on my own dime. Uh, that's something that requires big money and big tooling and it's a big, slow process. Um, it was also important to me to, so one of my biggest frustrations, uh, uh, that I had working in Sanzer was the fact that we were doing our manufacturing uh, offshore in China, like everybody does. There's nothing wrong with that, but it can be really frustrating to get the little details right. You know, there's something that you think, how could they possibly misinterpret this design? And then it comes back in the DHL package and you open it up and you go, oh my God, how... How did you misread that instruction? So that was very frustrating for me because I'm a little bit uh, detail obsessed. And so I wanted to work on something that could feasibly be manufactured domestically. And it's not that I'm a screaming patriot or, or, you know, any of that stuff. It's just that being able to do that locally, you can have more control and you can deliver something potentially very, very high quality. Or at least you can do that without having to spend half Mm -hmm. your time in China. So, okay, so that narrowed down the world because not a lot of things can practically be made here. If I wanted to make television displays, well, that's a terrible thing to try to manufacture in the U.S., right? Um, uh, So it would need to be something with a high enough price point where you're really paying for materials and that kind of stuff. Uh, And then some of it was like, well, what are the manufacturing techniques that I'm going to need to prototype this thing? Uh, circuit boards are easy. You can do that from anywhere through the web browser. In fact, I, I demoed that on some previous uh, yeah. uh, Spoon content. Um, and uh, 3D printing, you know, I've got a desktop 3D printer for less than $300 from Amazon. Uh, and 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 you kind of keep working through the techniques that you're going to need and go, can I afford to buy the machinery or can I afford to just kind of do order on demand for the things I need? And that narrowed down the scope. And then finally, it was, do I think I can afford to get to the stage I need on my own without having to spend my time doing fundraising activities? Mm-hmm. Um, that was a that was another lesson from Sanzer. It was exhausting and it was so distracting from the core of actually yeah. building the product. You don't, you, you, you don't build stuff. You're you're just raising money. You're doing PowerPoints to try and get people to give you money. I I, I hated it. Uh, now maybe <laughs> I, maybe I would feel differently if we were successful because we we weren't. But um, uh, so I wanted to pick something where you know I I, I had you know saved up uh, enough in my little squirreled away savings account that I could buy myself some time and some runway and a little bit of money for materials and supplies and things like that. And so that's how I arrived at choosing this idea. It was actually about, you know, these other ideas, I would have to restructure my life in a different way. I'd have to do it with a team. I'd have to raise money. We'd have to have an office, whatever. But what I'm working on fits in this tidy little box that I can do myself in the guest room turned laboratory uh, in our downtown apartment. So you, so you had ideas one through five, you, you, cause you have no shortage of ideas. You, you're always coming up with them. And when you started to realize at some point you made a decision, Hey, I want to build something again. I want to kind of make something great. You, you wind them up on the wall and said, Hey, this one is actually fits all these requirements. Yep. And that's, that's why I'm going to build it. Pretty much, it was. I had I had my moleskin notebook with tons of ideas mm-hmm. in it. We uh, we went out to the river uh, about an hour and a half from downtown. That was like 
kind of unplugged and off the grid on a snowy weekend and, you know, sat there with some yeah, Vince Guaraldi music playing and had a really good think about what I wanted to do. But but not all these ideas, one through five, I'm making up the number, like, were they things that had been made before? Because, like, that's still what strikes me. Like, this is something that hasn't been made for before. Yeah. And I'm thinking, I can't help but think this, like, okay, maybe it's something small. Maybe it's like some little tiny handheld gadget because, A, you're going to make it in, in the U.S. You know, were, were all these things like something that hadn't been made before? All these like ideas one through five? Not all of them were like, you know, category generators. Some of them were okay. iterations. This or is some a category of, generator, you feel like? I, I think so. I, I hope the world will think the same and that I'm not full of shit. Um, uh, uh, the other ones were uh, were things that I think there could have been a market for or were improvements on existing things. Some of them, uh, I, like I had this great idea. Um, this happens to me all the time, by the way. I have a, I have a great idea and then I discover that someone uh, has stolen my idea, gotten in a time machine, gone back to the past and come up with it first. <laughs> yeah. uh, and it's really annoying. What, one of them was I wanted to do latte tablets. Um, so uh, you, you're at whatever, your hotel room or the conference center or whatever, and you've got the Keurig to make a, a cup of coffee, but what you really want is a latte. This is like an Alka-Seltzer that's made with milk and uh, you know solidified CO2, and you drop it in the coffee, and it gets milky, and it foams itself. Wouldn't that be so cool? Uh, yeah. And I was so proud of myself, and I, I even did a little you know prototyping at home, kind of mixing some stuff up. And then I started digging, and somebody else came up with that idea long before me, and already owns the patent for it and, and the whole thing. So, so sometimes that's just the case and things have yeah. to get excluded. Yeah. Well, they're in cahoots with the person who's invented the time machine too. So like, <laughs> yeah. clearly, these, these people are working against you, but it must be a conspiracy. <laughs> it's a conspiracy. So tell people like when you think you're going to like come out, raise the velvet curtain and say, Hey, this is what I'm building. Like, do you have a timeline or like, you're just going to be tinkering until like, like really that's, that's your hard stop. Right. The hard stuff is always like, when do I run out of money? It's true. Um, uh, uh, I, you know, I hope that it's going to be uh, in the next couple of months. Um, but this is the thing about this process, in particular, this part of the process. The in order to in order to get this invention where I want it to be, I want to have a prototype that really performs. Like I, I want the real thing to perform, and to do that, I have to solve let's call it two dozen technical challenges, right? Um, and I'm solving them one by one. But okay. the, so, the solution to each one of them is totally unknown. Like, I don't know if I'm going to solve it in a day or, or three months, right? And also, when you solve solution, like, problem 10, does that then mean you have to go back and resolve solution number three? <laughs> like, no, lu three? Luckily, luckily, these things are linear. So I describe it. I don't know if this metaphor is going to make any sense to anybody else, but maybe it will. I'm in a hallway and there's one door in front of me. And I know that at the end of this hallway is success or I'm, yeah. you know, I'm finished, right? I don't know how many doors there are. And so my, my job right now is to try to smash through the door that's in front of me. And when I finally find a way through that door, it feels great. And then the next thing I see is the next door down the hallway. Uh, and that's, that's the process uh, that I'm in. I don't know how many doors there are. I don't know how long the hallway is. I don't know what it'll take to smash the next door. But I just kind of have to have blind faith that <laughs> there's a way through. So you're going to make this prototype. And then at that point, are you going to like reach out to partners to manufacture? Are you going to look to like a big appliance company? Are you going to go raise money? What's after that? So it's... Um, uh, it's a little uh, TBD, but I'll, I'll tell you my dream. I'll tell you plan plan A. Um, I've realized uh, over my my past experiences with MC, with Sansair, with Anofo, doing my own thing, and even with my time at Microsoft, um, that I really love zero to one. I really love the part that I'm in right now, which is that um, I'm making something new. I'm solving problems the world hasn't solved, but I'm doing them in a way that is suitable for producing a prototype, not the way that is suitable for mass production. Um, you know, 
bringing a product to market and having it be successful in the market for real involves so many other disciplines. It involves uh, marketing, it involves operations and finance and manufacturing oversight and team meetings and quarterly presentations and all this other stuff, um, which is, is important work for sure, but it's not my favorite part of the process. Uh, and so if I have the opportunity to get to spend as much of my career doing zero to one as possible, I think that's how I'm happiest. Um, so my hope is uh, I've got the patent uh, done for what I'm working on. Uh, when I get through prototype and spin up some flashy PowerPoints, bug all the friends in my network to test this thing and give me feedback and listen to my stupid pitch over and over and over again, then I would like to go to companies that might be able to commercialize it and do what they're really good at, which is make sure that it can get successfully manufactured and priced right and marketed yeah. right and distributed right and all that stuff, and hopefully allow me to go back to the next zero. Yeah. I mean, I think like what? 30, 40 years ago, you were an inventor, right? And those folks would basically try to find someone and sell it or they get a lawyer. I feel like now, like the modern equivalent equivalent of that is maybe like you create like an an innovation engine or like an innovation company. Like, I don't know, like you become like a Johnny Ive or something. There's like lots of these design companies, right? Um, I think our friend Samantha Rose, she's kind of going in that direction, right? So Sam Rose, who you worked with, Uh um, and I have a podcast coming up with her as well. Uh, she incubated um, at some point silicone spoons. And then she went and did like this crazy burr coffee grinder, which you helped her with. Uh-huh. And then she's doing other stuff. But but like zero to one, zero to one, zero to one. Yeah. And I, I think it um, it makes sense. Now, I, I kind of like the, you know, you, you said it 30, 40 years ago, but I kind of like the idea of, inventors being a discipline um, because it, it's a different set of skills than uh, than a lot of the yeah. rest of the product life cycle. Um, and, and honestly, it's a different, um, it takes a different set of emotional skills. It, it, it's, um, you know, what you're doing is fundamentally unknown. You don't know what, how the solutions yeah. can come together. And that, that is taxing. <laughs> like, you know, it's interesting, right? So like, if you look at like other creative pursuits, let's take like, you know, you know, entertainment, right? Like the novelist is like the inventor, right? He sits in his, his basement and he spends like a year writing the great American novel novel. But like, if you look at screenplays, right? Like it's, um, or like stuff you do for television, like it's like a bunch of people in a room, you get like the execs giving you feedback. So I feel like modern kind of creation of technology, at least in kind of a big company sense, is, is that latter, not the former. But you're trying to almost take the great American novel approach, which I feel like maybe that's a little bit of a lost. Or you do find some of these guys, like the inventor of like the kitchen gadget. They come to me sometimes. Uh-huh. Um, I get a lot of them pitching me and some of them are pretty cool. Some, well, like, some of them like, come to me too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Some of them, like, I'm like, you're crazy. I like yeah. it, but like, you're crazy. Well, I, so uh, Nathan Mirvold used to sort of give this answer when talking about how the modernist cuisine books came to be. And I think it's, I, I think it's spot on and I think it's applicable to what we're talking about. He said that, um, you know, there's fundamentally, there's two ways that stuff gets made. The first way is you go do a bunch of market research, you identify, you know, who's your customer and sort of concentric bullseyes and you ask them what do they want, what are the features they want, what's the pricing they want, and then you design a thing for them. And it's uh, and it's relatively a safe bet because you've pre-qualified all this stuff. And that's how most things get made. The second way is you make the thing that you want and then you hope that there are other people like you out there. And that tends to be the way that the boldest or sort of most breakthrough things get made, but it is also the way that a huge number of failures are created. Uh, yeah. And so you're, t- you're taking that risk. Um, and this, that is not to say that, that that first way, the market research way, is not valid or is not valuable. I don't, I don't mean to put it down in any way, but you know, how many at-bats do you really get? Uh, and I, I wanted to try to take a bold swing. That's great. Well, hopefully you'll you'll uh, have a, a batting average that's higher than 
than uh, a lot of the Mariners or my batting average. But like, I think you've, you've had a pretty good batting average so far. So, Scott Hyman Neger, I'm excited to have you come back to Smart Kitchen Summit 2021 in a virtual sense, of course. And then when you, you, everyone heard it, heard it here first, when Scott is ready to talk, he's going to come on the, the Food Tech Show. So, Oh, I can't wait. <laughs> well, Scott, thanks so much for appearing on the show, man. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me, Mike. Great to talk to you. All right. Once again, I want to thank Scott Hyman Neger, who I always enjoy talking to. I always learn a lot from him, and I hope you do t- as well. Man, can't you just wait to find out what he's actually building? Can't wait to have him back on the podcast. I'm going to hold him to that. As always, uh, the Spoon Podcast is brought to you by The Spoon. I am the host and producer. My name is Michael Wolf. And like I said, if you are making something great in in the kitchen, in food tech, go to SmartKitchenSummit.com and uh, apply for the Startup Showcase. We want to hear from you. We want you to pitch from the main stage. And uh, if you want to just come, buy a ticket. We'd love to have you. And once again, if you're going to see us, and you want to check out Food Tech there, if you want to show off your product, let us know. Just reach out to us. Email us at sponsor at thespoon.tech. Drop us a line. Let us know. We can get you more information. All right, folks. This has been great. We'll talk to you soon.